Hey, we had a question. Good morning, by the way. Morning, Bree. What are you looking at over there? Oh, you're playing catch up, huh? Yeah. What was that? Uh, the, the DOA thing. DOA thing. Yeah. Oh, there was a, yeah. a new circular r- related to uh, um, v- mandatory vaccinations for GovGuam employees. So they, I guess they revised it, and it's. Let me pull it up. Thank you for putting me on the spot. Sorry. Yeah, you got it. Hey, welcome back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's an a organizational circular requirement of government of Guam executive branch workers to vaccinate against COVID-19 guidance. Technical update number two. Um, there's a major change to requests for exemptions based on medical reasons. And so just the quick read of it looks like uh, you don't have to go to public health if you have a if you're a GovGuam employee and you want an exemption from the vaccination it now goes through i believe your supervisor oh. and they can approve those exemptions uh that's good because there's probably some other stuff in here but i haven't had a chance to fully go through it thank you um and yeah it was uh i don't know if they ever approved any of those uh because we had always heard that there was it was stuck at the ag or something so mm-hmm. That does kind of seem to simplify it. Uh, 832, Senator Joanne Brown's uh, coming up. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, we got a couple of interviews that, uh, on the way here. Lieutenant Governor Arnold Palacios. Have you been kind of following, Bree, a little bit uh, everything that's been going on in the NMI? They announced uh, their historic announcement of um, the Democrat uh, gubernatorial ticket. Yeah, I saw that. It was uh, Representative Tina Sablon and then uh, Representative uh, Layla uh, Staffler mm-hmm. out of Tinian, mm-hmm. right? Um, first all-female uh, team to run for uh, governor. So we'll get the lieutenant governor, uh, the sitting lieutenant governor, uh, Arnold Palacios, uh, who is campaigning against his governor, uh, Governor Ralph Torres, uh, coming up on the show. Brian, I don't know if you saw this uh, here, but... Uh, it looks like uh, they're going to be doing a survey at the Guam Memorial Hospital. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just saw that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess they're going to be finding out from the rank and file how they feel about um, their what their supervisors and leaders at GMH. Yeah, we actually obtained this. Uh, I, I saw it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an informational circular uh, for GMH employees and medical staff members uh, coming from hospital administrator, CEO, Lillian Posadas. Uh, 2021 employee survey during the coming weeks, we'll be conducting an organization wide employee survey to get a better, better understanding of employee morale, satisfaction and engagement at Guam Memorial Hospital Authority. The survey is part of our commitment to ensuring the voices of our employees are heard. Uh, We will use the survey results for three purposes to recognize skilled leaders who engage their teams in a positive way, to improve our policies, to make them more practical and effective, and to address problem areas that demotivate people, compromise customer satisfaction, or diminish performance. Uh, The Equal Employment Opportunity and the communications and marketing teams uh, developed the survey using SurveyMonkey. Uh, The survey will be accessible electronically beginning uh, January 26th, yesterday, um until february 11th your honesty in responding to the questions is key we cannot affect change until we identify our weaknesses and you are integral to that journey the survey is anonymous Um, once the survey period closes the compiled data will be shared with all staff so you can see for yourself how we're doing in the months that follow the survey management will meet with relevant parties to discuss plans to improve culture performance and address any problem areas Uh, The goal is for the entire organization to participate in the survey so that insight can drive meaningful change. With just five to ten minutes of your time, you can help make GMHA an even better place to work. Uh, So, yeah, heads up, my GMH employee uh, family, uh, because we did talk about in this oversight hearing of the Guam Hospital how uh, all these uh, above-step recruitments they're doing over at the hospital affect uh, morale. And I know some of the employees have been itching uh, for a chance to express that and this looks like uh it's it uh 835 senator joanne brown we're gonna start uh before she gets in we're gonna play this little clip here from session uh, i believe this is on uh, tuesday and senator joanne brown is uh, talking about the war claims of uh, brie and uh they were i don't know what the status is now with the bill because there was just like million amendments but we will find out from the senator uh but it's kind of that 
argument about paying the war claims out. Do we use our own money from the general fund or the Section 30 federal fund? And so Senator Brown was um, uh, uh, kind of arguing the point that we shouldn't be using the local money because it kind of defeats the intent of the purpose of the whole uh, war claims uh, thing. But we're going to play this uh, clip here, and then we're going to go in with uh, Senator Brown. Oh, is that in the new one, Jay? Hold on. Good morning, by the way. We're brought to you by Pacific Points, Cabo Enterprises, it &E, and Jack in the Box. Where is that, Jay? Oh, in uh, today, the 27th? Session yeah. side. Yeah. Got it. Okay, thank you. So, Senator Joanne Brown, right here on the link. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I'm in agreement probably with most of this amendment, but I do have one major disagreement, and that's with the word may. As I mentioned in my previous comments earlier today, I'm very much of the opinion that with regards to these funds going to pay our remaining war survivors, that that should come from a federal source. And that specifically at this point, and as was determined by Congress previously, uh, that it should come from the Section 30 funds because at least that is coming from federal sources in terms of the money that's reimbursed back to Guam for the military personnel that have been assigned to the island. I think that's critical. Otherwise, we are simply, as I mentioned earlier, literally having the victims on Guam pay for their own compensation out of their own funds. You know, this whole idea of taking the drop of water that we may call the Section 30 fund and putting it into the pond of water that we call the general fund and say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's all together. I don't think so. I think as this amendment outlines a specific source of how and when and when and well and the governor's going to report and all those wonderful things. But if we don't identify that shall come from the general fund, I think it, it doesn't follow through with what is an expectation, even though it's a lowered expectation than others that have been compensated by the federal government with regards to injuries and atrocities suffered during World War II. And I think colleagues, with all the challenges that our people are currently experiencing. I mean, we have a responsibility here in the legislature to be the trust of the public purse, to ensure that we are properly spending the funds of our people. And I think we need to distinguish between the monies that we identify as general fund revenues versus the federal money of Section 30. I mean, right now, we simply cannot, and the concerns are there, even provide adequate education for our children. We already see those issues coming up right now. I mean, just even because of this pandemic, we can't even have consistent teaching in the classroom to ensure that our children are properly learning. And we're now going on year three. We cannot ensure, and even though, you know, the governor made a big pronouncement last week about increasing the uh, compensation to law enforcement, it's unfortunate because it's across the board, which still puts the Guam police at the bottom of that list, but we can't ensure the personal safety of our people. Our people put bars on their houses, put cameras out on their houses, put fences around their houses to protect themselves because they can't even feel safe in their own community now. We can't even ensure that, you know, we're going to go into our supermarkets and even have a consistent supply of food for our people right now. We can't even do that with the general fund money. And we just can't turn a blind eye to those realities because we, even though we say excess, we cannot even fund these things now. So I think it's critical that we distinguish between what is the general fund revenues that we have and the federal funding, which is where this money should come from. Because what are you going to do? Are we going to turn a blind eye, look away, or even now earlier, let's close our ears and not hear the concerns of our people out in our community? We have a responsibility to ensure how the public funds are spent. And I think it's critical that we carefully and very clearly distinguish how the public funds are spent. We shouldn't think of ourselves as elite here in the Guam legislature and not be aware of the challenges that are facing our people out there because we can't fund these demands and needs of our people right now. We'd like to say it, it's an election year, and boy, don't we want to go out there and tell them all the great things that we're giving them. Certainly the administration's doing a wonderful job at that. I can't imagine what more we're going to hear in the next few months leading up to the election. But this particular issue demands that our people be compensated from a federal source. Otherwise, we cannot say we are giving them public acknowledgement and proper recognition. Because we're, we cannot put ourselves up on the pedestal thinking that we somehow are in our position to do that. 
This is an obligation of the federal government. Unfortunately, after much effort from many of our congressional representatives, we've not been able to get it at a level of where it should be. Because our people are getting less than anyone else that's since been compensated by the U.S. federal government. And we know who they are. And yet we're settling because what choice do we have but for us to further subjugate our people by having these funds come from the general fund and not from Section 30. I object. I think we must change the language from may to shall come from the general fund, from Section 30, not from the general fund, but specifically from Section 30 monies. And then I can actually vote for this bill. I think it's an acknowledgement that's necessary. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to comment on this amendment. Thank you, Senator Brown. I comment on this amendment. Thank Senator, you, Senator uh, Brown. Thank you, Senator uh, Brown. Uh, and now we got Senator Brown live uh, here in our KUAM uh, link Zoom room. Good morning, Senator. Half a day. Good morning. Good, good morning, morning to both of you, Sabrina and Chris. How are you? It's good to see you again, Sabrina. Thanks. Good to see you too. Uh, Hope so you're a little rested and rejuvenated for another year. Oof. Uh, oh, no, it's going to be a big year. Yeah, it's huge. There's an election <laughs> this year, by the way. Yep. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. my, already? How did that happen? Yeah. Good morning. Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. It's going to be an interesting year. I don't know how it'll turn out, but it'll be an interesting year. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, Senator, can you just start? What is the status of, of that amendment you were speaking to? Uh, I know that you were trying to make uh, the amendment, or it was the... Uh, the amendment was so uh, that the money shall come from uh, Section 30, and then there was the word may in there, which kind of left it a little bit open. So did the amendment... Right, pass right. And, and, and certainly we pushed, uh, Senator Frank Blas and I uh, were pushing to have the word uh, may change to shall. Of course, you know, they're going to look as they did with the original action that happened with Congress. Uh, you know, the government of Guam fronted the funds so that they could begin the process of the payouts. And we pretty much wanted to mirror that process as well, even though recognizing, you know, we're not all happy that Section 30 money was being used as a funding source to pay for war reparations. But that's, you know, this is where we're at. Uh, and I very much wanted to see us replicate as close as we could to that process, because I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that that compensation should be directly connected to a federal source. And right now that source is Section 30. So. Uh, that had been our hope in, in wanting to move that amendment forward. And unfortunately, it failed yesterday. Uh, the language still says may, uh, which leaves that up to the administration. You know, they may use it, but then again, they may not. So I'm hoping that uh, when we do address the budget for the upcoming fiscal year, uh, that language is put in there very specifically to make sure that that reimbursement comes from, from Section 30 money so that there's a direct federal connection to what I see, you know, people talk about recognition, justice, acknowledgement of the suffering of our people. But, you know, I, I just didn't, in my mind, have a very difficult time trying to settle here uh, the whole idea that the, those of our people that were victimized during the war are now expected to pay their own reparations. I mean, that's unheard of. That that just boggles my mind to try to understand that that is the logic that we're putting in place. And while some may say, well, it's in symbolic, you know, mm. it's, it's all in the same pot. Uh, I, I think symbolism uh, in this particular case is very important because I'll tell you, if, if, if I go back, I was calculating the years last night, 33 years since I served as executive director of the Guam War Reparation Commission when I was appointed by Governor Atta to staff the commission. Uh, and the public members, the war survivors that uh, were on that commission was Be the late Beatrice Emsley, the late Tun Pete Cruz, and the late uh, former mayor of Jonia, Vicente Bernardo. Uh, and I had the opportunity to learn, to work from them, to staff them, uh, to accompany them to Washington, D.C., to testify before the U.S. Congress to bring their story. Uh, and what they went through, what our people went through, they represented our people in the halls of Congress and they work so hard as many, many, many have, you know, in paving the way of this issue, of, you know, all the way back to Congressman Wampat. Uh, and to simply just look at it at this point that, oh, you know, we need to pay it, let's just pay it, and it doesn't matter where it comes from, we'll just pay it. It doesn't address the issue of reparations in terms of what that, what that actually means and what, what ultimately it should mean for our people. So I have a very different perspective because I've had, a, you know, an upfront dealing with, with members of our community, including my own family. I mean, my grandfather um, is the only surviving grandparent I grew up with because my grandmother died a few years after World War II. Uh, and I know many, many family members of all of us that are descendants of those that were here during the war. You know, we, 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 you know, we grew up with this understanding and this concern. Also the fact that our people were never properly 
compensated and recognized for what they went through. And our families were devastated. I mean, my grandfather, you know, had his family was in his early 40s. He lived in a Ganya, not too far from the governor's palace. And literally as many of our people, you know, their homes were destroyed and they had to start their lives again. Many of the families from Aganya moved up to Sendahanya as those in Sumai moved to Santa Rita. And they literally had to start from nothing. Uh, so I think we all recognize that. We all have a very, you know, emotional connection to that issue. Uh, so to me, I, like I said, it boggles my mind that we would not want to make effort uh, to, you know, even though it's, it's, it's not exactly ideally what we wanted, uh, you know, to make that connection so that that recognition and that compensation comes from federal hands. Uh, yeah, um, Senator, so where is this idea that uh, our general fund is um, in such great shape that we can take $25 million for the LEAP, that we can, you know, fund these war claims on the... I mean, am I missing something? Uh, you know, I'm missing it with you, Chris and Sabrina. I'm missing it too because I, I've been in government many years. You know, this is not my first rodeo at the Guam legislature. I mean, I, I was, you know, first a senator 28 years ago and, and we've been through hard times. I mean, I know what it is and the challenge is sometimes in a single fiscal year, sometimes readdressing the budget two or three times to try to get through that fiscal year and cover our, our main obligations to our people. And this idea, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic because yes, we are going through this pandemic that I, I know none of us, you know, we even imagined that we would ever be experiencing this and what, what a hardship it is. Uh, you know, the loss of jobs, the impact to our local economy, knowing, and we know uh, we will not survive if we were simply just dependent on our own ability to generate funds right now. Uh, but this idea that we take this circumstance, this unfortunate circumstance and make it look like a financial windfall and act and spend accordingly uh, when, you know, as they say, all that goes, goes up will come down. And there's going to come a time when the revenues from the federal government are not going to be flowing through the island as they are right now. And I don't think we're planning or preparing for that reality very well. Uh, the appropriations, I mean, you know, even the EITC money when there's, oh, we're going to get reimbursed for EITC. I mean, the amount of bills that were introduced to expend that far exceed the you know the the amount that's even there and even up till you know recently we still don't hear about where and when if at all this EITC money is going to be you know transferred to the government of Guam but we're very quick members of the legislature are very quick to want to appropriate left and right without any preparation of the reality that's coming and right now even our private sector a large portion of our private sector is very dependent upon the actions that we take now uh, through grants and other types of funding the leap funding to be able to helpfully bridge over this this challenging time so that they can you know hopefully keep their businesses operating keep their people employed and i just think there's a whole layer in our leadership that is not really coming to terms with that reality and planning according and you're seeing it. You're seeing constant appropriation for things that, you know, in most days we would say, hey, that's not a critical need. But, you know, politically we want to play that game and, and it will be at the expense. There, there's no free ride. It'll be at the expense of our people ultimately because we, we've not made the best of decisions during this time with how we spend their money. But, Senator, it's an election year. Yeah, but you know what, Chris, election year, you know, comes every other year. Every other year, there's an election year. And, you know, we're not guardians of the galaxy, okay? Let's not even consider ourselves in, in that. Wait a minute. Ranking, you, wait right? a minute. You like guardians we're of the not galaxy? The guardians of the galaxy. You just got okay? way cooler in my book. We're not even Rocket. You know, Rocket's pretty smart. <laughs> uh, and, and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to resolve the pandemic. But one thing, you know, we do have a responsibility to do in our respective jobs is we're supposed to be the guardians of the public purse. We're supposed to ensure the responsible expenditure of public money. That's one responsibility and authority that we do have. Uh, and we should be doing it. And, and unfortunately, I'm not seeing that. I think, uh, you know, I certainly will continue to, with my one vote, continue to be conscientious of that and responsible with regards to what, what we are authorizing in terms of expenditure. And right now you see the administration coming up with their own agenda. I mean, it's it's government all alone up at Avaloop. You know, they're older. Now we're really hearing through press releases. So oh, I talked to Senator so-and-so, St. Augustine, and, you know, we're going we're gonna to increase the, the obligation of the people of Guam by $16 million. No one's going to argue the importance of law enforcement. Like no one's going to argue the need for teachers. No one's going to argue the need, especially during this time, for for nurses and doctors and other medical personnel that that are there to help our people. 
but you know, can we afford it all? And are we making promises that ultimately we're, we're going to not be able to deliver on, or we're going to start cutting positions in the government of Guam because we can't make enough money to meet payroll. And we've, we've seen those days, you know, since the time of Joada and Frank Blas's administration, Everything in between has been a juggling act financially because we never generated that kind of money to say, oh, we're exceeding revenue projections. And you hear that often, oh, 60 million. 60 million, I'm sure, can be eaten up very quickly in our public health system and our educational system and trying to provide our children with an adequate education, which we can't do now. Just even getting our kids consistently in the classroom and getting them properly educated. Our people, I mean, my goodness, we have to think how much more can we imprison ourselves in our home with bars and, uh, you know, cameras and fences and alarm systems because we don't feel safe in our own homes. I mean, how many of our mononcos, some of them who live alone? You know, they don't feel safe in this community. What are we doing to address those issues? We can't even protect our people from being raped and murdered and abused in this community right now. Uh, but, you know, oh, we have money for everything that we, we think is popular and think is going to, you know, make us look good and feel good. And we're really doing a big disservice to this community by not being more responsible uh, with how we're, we're using their money. And really, it's their money. Senator, I wanted to just a couple different issues that uh, we've reported on. First, I wanted to get a reaction uh, from you. We had the Admiral on um, mm -hmm. relative to the Eagles Field property and, you know, the governor's uh big legacy project uh her purse project uh to build the billion dollar healthcare complex up there at eagles field uh it was kind of unclear um how far along uh she was in accomplishing that goal of getting that lease or license or whatever from uh dod but when the admiral came on he had basically said that um there's no lease that they allowed the governor to look at the property and determine if uh, it would be feasible to have a facility there. But at the end of the day, that property was now being looked at by the Missile Defense Agency uh, to construct a missile defense uh, site there. And I mean, he kind of made it sound pretty much like that's a done deal and the governor's going to have to go find somewhere else to build that billion dollar healthcare complex, which I thought was so interesting because the way this whole thing started was that that was how they started. They started like, we want to build it at Eagles Field. And it was they were firm on that all the way. It was like cart before the horse, totally. Uh, but now the admirals come out, and I mean, if you listen to this story, if you read it, uh, it pretty much seems like there's going to be a missile defense thing there. Well, I think the whole issue of Eagle Field, and certainly, yes, I mean, the administration made very big, bold pronouncements that it was going to be there, come hell or high water. It's going to be built there, and this whole huge complex was going to be included. But I think the, the issue of the land itself, I mean, I think that would have been a controversy that would, would continue to, to come to surface, certainly because, you know, the view is if, if the military had no longer, you know, no longer an official need for that land, that it should be part of the, the turnover back to the people of Guam. And certainly, you know, the landowners and their descendants are, are there raising a very legitimate issue that if it's no longer being used for defense, then it should come back to our people. And, and, and you know, rightly so, it's their land. It was taken from them. So I don't think it would have been a smooth ride anyway with regards to that because we would have had concerns. Uh, and even when we had, uh, you know, a public hearing with regards to the initial appropriation to set money aside for the medical, uh, for the hospital, the medical facility, um, you know, we had a number of landowners and their descendants come and protest that issue and testify before the legislature. So I don't think that would have been such a done deal with regards to even local policy. Uh, concerning the construction there. We have asked the question and brought it before. Why aren't we looking at alternate sites? Because I don't necessarily believe, and it'd be nice. I mean, there's a lot of things we'd love to have, but can we afford it? And the idea of putting this this huge complex and taking, you know, behavioral health out of Timuning and, you know, sticking them there and public health all of a sudden needed to be there too. And, you know, the infrastructure itself, just to put that in place would have been significant on top of actually building a, a, a facility to standard and then the bigger issue is, is operating it and the cost to operate it. Uh, you know, we can promise all these things, but can the people of Guam afford it? And even though we know we need a, you know, a good facility, a new facility, uh, you know, ideally we didn't, we, we, you know, the question is, could we afford it long term? And even though, you know, the governor is looking, well, I've got these federal monies, I'm going to take it out of here and there and we'll put it together. Uh, we can't even do that now with our hospital. Let's not kid ourselves, Chris, just not too long ago. I mean, the hospital couldn't even get all the medications that they needed. And then when you say misuse of, 
hiring and other things there, you got to wonder, you know, where the priorities are. So uh, it's good to know they're acknowledging that they're going to have to look at alternate sites, even the original uh, location in, in Oka where the, uh, you know, the old hospital used to be. Uh, but I think we need to do what we can afford. I mean, we want a lot of things and it's easy to promise. Delivering is a total different story. And again, can our people afford it? Uh, you know what? I don't, I don't think it's necessary that all these facilities need to be adjacent to each other with that higher price. Uh, there was also another issue, a uh, crack shot story out of the KUM news team relative to one of your colleagues, uh, Vice Speaker Tina Munya Barnes and her extended uh, absence here. We're talking about a quarter of a term, right? And, um, well, uh, we did do that story and posted it up in the comments. Uh, they were pretty interesting, uh, Senator. But just on, on uh, just your initial reaction, uh, because why we'd done the story is we knew that this, the Vice Speaker had been gone for such a long time, but there was literally no information on um, how long she was gone, uh, whether or not she was working, or uh, when she was even going to return, right? Um, and so we did the story. She's gone. Uh, we did get a statement that, that she said that she has been, uh, like many people, working remotely. That's a quote from that statement. So just what's your reaction on, I guess, just the absence and its impact, if any, on the legislature? Well, I mean, ultimately, I think that's something for Senator, you know, Barnes to respond to her, to the people in the community and her constituency. I mean, we've all gone through in varying degrees of, of illness within our families and some of our members, you know, ourselves have had to deal with those issues. Uh, but the challenge is, you know, we're in a public position, a little different from just our regular, you know, our regular job that, that uh, doesn't carry this public responsibility. Uh, I think, you know, I'm hoping at some point she'll make an affirmative decision if she's able to come back, if that's her intention, uh, or is she planning on stepping down because, you know, her family obligations. I think we all understand that a family is, you know, comes first. I mean, even if we are in a public capacity and, you know, I understand uh, she has a family member that is in a really critical health situation. We heard, you know, last latter part of last year, she was also involved in a serious accident. I mean, you don't wish that on anyone. Uh, but I'm sure at some point, because the absence is is significantly long, uh, you know, she should come out and make a public determination and and let us know, you know, us as colleagues and and the people more importantly, what her plans are. Because I think it's very hard to sustain this uh, if you plan on coming back and running again, unless she plans on you know not seeking reelection. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we do have a public obligation for the time that we're here to fulfill our responsibilities, and if we're unable to because of other pressing needs in our family as we all you know can empathize and understand uh, then maybe we have to make you know our own decisions that if we can't fulfill our obligations and sometimes we might need to step down or step aside and uh, you know I don't think anyone would ever hold that against you uh, if, if you're in that situation but but some something at some point needs to come I mean to continue on this way I, I don't think the public would find that acceptable no matter what our circumstance because we we were in a position to make a decision on how we deal with it and while we're in public life, uh, we do have public obligations. And if we're not able to fulfill them, then we need to be upfront with the people and say, you know, I, I cannot because I have this extending obligation to my family. It's a priority, understandable. Uh, and I'm not able to fulfill my, my public responsibilities. And so, you know, I can step down uh, and that's an option. Yeah. But, you know, we are waiting. We don't hear any more than you do. I mean, we're in the Guam legislature. We hear the motions every session to excuse members that are not present. At some point, I wonder if I should raise my hand and say, uh, can we have an explanation? Because yeah. Where's your sometimes note? the absence are pretty much the same members, uh, you know, that are not here for whatever reason. I, they don't let us know why they're not there. Maybe the speaker knows as the head of the body, maybe they relay to her that they, you know, where they're at. Yeah. But uh, the rest of us don't necessarily know where our colleagues are in their absence. I did do like kind of a cursory review of the, the attendance. And I noticed obviously the vice speaker um, has been absent since July of last year. But then also Senator Mary Torres uh, is absent quite a quite a bit. Uh, but there was a little thing, uh, Senator, I wanted to ask you about because the cameras didn't catch it. But I had heard that uh, Senator Mary Torres was like covering her ears when you were uh, speaking um, at the legislature. I really tried to find the video because I heard it from uh, actually a few of your colleagues and some other uh, friends down at the legislature. I mean, talk about Queen Petty. That is just uncalled for. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe she doesn't want to hear what I have to say. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue to speak out. Some people go, well, Joanne, you know, you're very strong with what we know. But, you know, I, I, I'm not a scripted senator. 
Uh, you know, it's one of the surprises for me coming back after 14 years is how scripted the Guam legislature is. You know, it, it's it's kind of vanilla. A lot of my colleagues have their, and I don't know if they spent the time to write their written statements, but it's it's very scripted. And I, I'm not of that. I mean, unless I, you know, you're giving the state of whatever address, maybe that needs to be written. But, you know, I, I speak from the heart. I speak from my mind, what I think and what I have in a position. And and you know, I, I've I've had many years of experience with oratory. So and that and it's a losing art that we have now because not everyone who is in the legislature has the ability to get up and articulate uh, what they have to say. You know, some of them are very dependent on their computers and who's typing their response at the other end in some cases, or you know, their prescripted statements that they read out. I mean, even introducing a bill or closing on a bill, it's written out, and maybe they need to do it to put all their thoughts together, but. Uh, I kind of like people that look me in the eye and, and say what they got to say. That to me has a little more value. At least I'm feeling it's a more genuine presentation. So for me, with regards to speaking on the war reparations issue, I'm passionate about it because I have some direct firsthand experience. I have many people that I, I sat down and helped fill in their, their applications for compensation that have since passed away. Uh, people, you know, elderly that, that otherwise would never come down to the governor's office. Uh, and many of them have passed. I've been to the funerals of every single one of my, you know, public board, public members on the Guam War Reparations Commission and, and have been to their funerals, knowing that uh, this issue was never resolved before their time. And my own family and in my family's experience and what, I, what I've learned and what I've heard, what I've heard from my grandfather. So it, it's very personal to me. And I, I don't think you can speak of these issues and not have some, some, some concern and some heart uh, because of what our people went through. So... You know, if I'm a little too passionate for some, you know, I, I'm not going to fit everybody's cup of tea, but uh, I'm going to be able to express what it is that I feel and what it is that I think and what it is that I feel I need to say while I'm there. Yeah, well, you got to be passionate if you're working for the people, so. I would hope so, because <laughs> I, I'm really not here just to take up space. I mean, I, I was a senator when I was in my 20s, you know, and, and I had fortunately a lot of uh, a lot of good people that, uh, you know, that I got had an opportunity to work with who were very experienced, you know, people like Joe T. San Augustine, Tony Umpinko, who I have tremendous respect for. The speaker Umpinko was the guiding light for many of us. He helped orientate us, many of us young senators that, uh, you know, years later, I still learn and appreciate everything that he provided. Yeah. Let me tell you a uh, story. John Uggen, oh. you know, these are people that I, I had the opportunity. To, and even Ted Nelson, who's quite a talker. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, you learn. I had the opportunity to learn from him. I, I could not ever, nobody could ever out-talk Ted Nelson. You know, sometimes people, like now, if you go to committee, the whole, we're kind of raising concern about the very limited restrictions that this legislature has put in place with regards to asking questions and commenting. Because you can only speak or ask questions for five minutes, three rounds, and that's it. And then you can't get back on the floor and, and comment on the bill. Very restrictive. But the original reason the 15-minute rule was put in is because of Ted Nelson. No, because he could he could go on and <laughs> on and on. So, uh, uh, but you know, it was all a learning experience, and, and you know, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, Governor Ada gave me such a tremendous start in my my government career that you know now we you know thirty years in hindsight looking back, I, I I'm very blessed to have had those opportunities. Uh, so you know, I, I'm fortunate in that. Yeah, uh, you know, I went to lunch one time with uh, the late speaker uh, Tony and Pinko, uh, and we had eaten. It was a like a Vietnamese type place, and and so sure. he, he ordered the pork chops. But the thing that got me was when he ordered the pork chops, um, he said, "Oh, can you cook it medium?" And when the waitress went away, I was like, "Man, speaker, you eat your pork chops cooked medium?" And he was like, "No, boy, they always overcook it." So that's the nice way of telling them. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, speaker was a connoisseur. If you want yeah. to know where the best restaurants were, you know, <laughs> Vietnamese, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony and Pinko knew. He yeah. knew where to go, you know, and uh, those are all good memories, I'll tell you. I, I, I miss him. You know, it's, it's hard to believe it's 14 years. This this year, I believe, will be the 15th year since he passed away. Yeah, uh, but, you know, he it's it's the kind of legacy that they leave behind and, and the experiences and, and the opportunities that they provide for you and the learning lessons that they provide for you. And he's it was a very good influence in me, certainly uh, in running for office. And many of us, many of us, and even those that have gone on to be governor, you know, that he's planted a seed with. So uh, I think that's something we got to appreciate, hopefully uh, pass on for the hopeful up and coming. I hope that we are going to have a new generation to come and take on so that, you know, the rest of us can retire and move on to other things. Senator, thank you for your time. It's always great thank to have you, you on. Senator Brown. Good to have you. Good to see to Sabrina, you guys take care, and I, I'm hoping for a better year. Let's let's hope and look forward to that. Hey, you know, no expectations, no disappointments. <laughs> <laughs>
you're kind of jaded. Though. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Bye, Senator. Jaded. Nah. Okay, yeah. Uh, 906. You guys ready? You got your passport? What do you mm -hmm. need to go to the CNMI, Tomas? Uh, you need a mandatory, mandatory health declaration form, your passport, and uh, you're going to get swabbed twice when you land. So. Do I need a negative COVID test? Uh, no, you. hopefully it's negative.